Welcome back. You're still watching tonight, and it's time that we want to have a conversation with the chairperson of the Social Health Authority, Dr. Timothy Olwen. Good evening. Thank you. And it's good to see you um, here. Let's start by understanding, because there has been this talk about uh, we're transitioning from the Social Health Authority, uh, I mean, from the National Health Insurance Fund to the Social Health Authority. Maybe you may want to appraise us on what exactly are the steps that you've taken so far getting to SHA? I think, first of all, it's important to clarify for the viewers that the Social Health Authority in itself is a single body, but it houses three funds, as opposed to the National Health Insurance Fund, mm -hmm. which was a fund in itself, and it was an entire body on its own. Um, so the Social Health Authority is, uh, is, is the body that is going to manage three funds. The first fund is the primary health care fund. Then you've got the Social Health Insurance Fund, which would, might, might be the, what is the equivalent of NHIF at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then it also has an emergency chronic and chronic and critical illness fund. So it's mm -hmm. got those three funds. So in terms of the transition, NHIF, uh, by operation of law, because there were new new uh, acts that acts that came into force, mm -hmm. and the NHIF Act was repealed, it means the NHIF in effect has has transferred all its functions to the Social Health Authority. However, the mandate of the Social Health Authority is wider, mm -hmm. so it offers a wider range of uh, of benefits than NHIF did before. So transferring the mandate of NHF to the Social Health Authority, mm. in practical sense, what is that? It's going to be a bit of a complex process because you do understand that NHF had got its operations. So at the moment we've got the CS uh, Health, the, C, the CS Health of those who gazetted a transition, a transition committee. Mm -hmm. NHF is supposed to be wound up within a period of one year according to the law. And uh, during that time period, you're onboarding most of the functions from the NHIF to the Social Health Authority. So the Social Health Authority gradually takes all those functions. The transition committee is supposed to now, for example, manage the assets, the liabilities, and so on, and hand them over to the Social Health Authority. So you've got a complex reporting structure as well because both boards, the NHIF board, still exists for a year. We've got our Social Health Authority board, and of course, the parent ministry also has to be kept appraised of things. So it's a bit of a complicated matrix. So let, let's, let's speak practically as of now. Yes. A patient goes to a hospital, they probably need pre-authorization. Yes. So do they apply to NHF or to the Social Health Authority? And when they apply, who does that? At the uh, moment, it's the NHIF infrastructure that is still in, in operation because we didn't want to interfere with, uh, interfere with service provision. So then the NHIF infrastructure is what is still in place. So service is continuing. It's continuing using that same process as before. Until the time when the Social Health Authority starts registering people, then now we'll have some of those functions being transferred to the Social Health Authority. But at the moment, the NHIF infrastructure is what is in place. You have an acting CEO. Yes. The current NHIF CEO. Yes. Who is he reporting to? He's, at the moment, he's reporting to both boards. On what now? Well, one on winding up functions and the other one on continuing operations. And, and how is that affecting the operations? Because you can imagine that um, the board that is chaired by engineer Kamau also has expectations from the CEO who is the head of the management side. Uh, so how is that working for? Their functions are, 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 are minimal. Their functions are minimal at the moment. So I do agree it's a bit of a complicated reporting structure, but in view of the the, the knowledge that he had, especially of NHIF operations, it only made sense for us to use him as an active, active CEO before we get a substantive one. Because the process of recruiting a substantive CEO, and by the time he gets appraised with all the operations and so on, it would have taken a while. But the f rules are actually different because, I've, like I've said, one is winding up and the other one is continuing operations and ramping them up. So you were appointed in November 2023. There was a court case that um, was dispensed with on the 19th of uh, January, which is just about two weeks ago. Yes. So what have you been able to do so far? Well, at the moment, we, we are at the stage where we are work, working on the regulations and now we want to commence public participation. In fact, at the time when we got injunctive orders, injunctive orders that were uh, uh, stopping the implementation of the SHI Act, mm -hmm. we were just at the point we wanted to start public participation. So at the moment, the law states that we have got to do public participation on the regulations. Those regulations are what operationalize the acts. And once that is done, we're supposed to go back to Parliament, the Dele Committee on Dele Delegated Legislation, and possibly again to the health committees of the Senate and Parliament. And thereafter, the minister, the CS Health, will gazette the regulations. Then we can start the process of registration and so on.
Okay. Uh, I thought it's the Cabinet Secretary and the Ministry that are conducting the public participation. So what is your role within this public participation? Our role is very clear because we are an integral part of the public participation because we are the, the body that actually is, uh, is, is going to implement those regulations. So we play an integral part. So it's a joint function, but we do it together. So who is doing that at SHA? At SHA. We have got our secretariat at the moment together with me as chairman. So we're going to be going around the country and participating, uh, sorry, conducting public participation mm. over the next two weeks. Um, and even what I'm doing now is part of what okay. we, we're doing as public participation in disseminating information because we lost a lot of time right. during the time when we could not operate because of the court orders. Do you know how many people sit in your secretariat? Yes, we the have transitional got secretariat. In the secretariat, yes, we've got the director. We've got we've got four people who are part of the secretariat from the SHA side. Mm -hmm. Then we've got a transition committee, transition committee, which was gazetted the other day. How, how many people are you talking about? The transition committee, I think, is is nine is nine people. Nine people. So yes. in total, the, those are thirteen. Of course, you yes. Can and then you've got the people members. who are incorporated again from the Ministry of Health. Yes. But you see now, we also they use expertise as and when required. So when they need expertise, they draw from the ministry. They draw from NHIF. So that's how the transition is supposed to work. The reason I'm asking that question is because, you see, you're saying that you're busy doing the transitional work. Mm. But then again, you're also doing yeah, the public participation. You're supposed to be determining what establishment is sufficient, staff establishment is sufficient for SHA. Isn't that so much work within a very short time, yet by November, there cannot be any operation of NHIF? You, you must remember that public participation is something that has been done before, even within NHIF. So we're using the entire NHIF infrastructure and the Ministry of Health and Infrastructure countrywide are going to be involved in public participation. So it's not us, we're going to be leading the teams, but the truth is the people who are going to do most of the, most of the groundwork are going to be people in the periphery. Is it legal to use NHIF staff to do this? NHIF has staff as it is right now actually acting SHA staff. Because NHIF- Based on what law? Sorry? Based on what law? How can they be acting staff of, NH, of SHA? That's what I'm saying. That is, that is how the transition was designed. Because at the end of the day, we have said the winding up operations are being done. But you must remember, all assets, liabilities, obligations, and everything, including the staff, actually, are acting in an acting capacity. The only difference was that for the staff themselves, for them to be onboarded into SHA, the law was explicit that they need to reapply for those positions. And that is subject to SHA having de determined its organizational structure mm -hmm. and determined what kind of skills they need in terms of what number of people, and that's going to be the basis for them to apply. So and th that is not yet done? No, it's not yet done. I told you we've, we've only been able to operate for two weeks purely because yeah. of the legal encumbrance we had. So once, w when do you foresee a situation where you're ready to now go ahead and recruit uh, staff of SHA? At the moment, we have decided to put that on the back burner because it's not a priority. The key thing, the key thing is to make sure service is not disrupted. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're concentrating on operations initially. In terms of being able to onboard staff officially, I can see that in the next three to six months. So the transition committee has got a time frame of, of six months. You must remember that we are a new body and therefore even in terms of being able to, to be registered as an authority and, 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 uh, and categorized by this state corporations advisory committee, that has to be done and that's the job of the transition committee. And of course, the regulations will have a bearing on how soon you begin to register members. Yes. From your estimate, do you have a practical date that that can begin? In terms of when we can start to registering register members? Members of SHA. The objective was it was supposed to be the beginning of March. It mm -hmm. is a very tight time frame because if you think about public participation for another two weeks, then you talk about the going through the legislative bodies and getting the go ahead and then the gazettement. It's a very tight time frame, but that's what we're still working with. So what's practical? So, so the Kenyans did not wake up on 1st of March and nothing is working as per the The promise. good thing is, the good thing for Kenyans is that at the moment services are still being provided. So I don't think there should be an absolute urgency to convert from NHIF to SHA. We'll do it within the time frame that we can. The key thing is to be able to do it right. Okay. Yes. How long should registration take? Registration by law is supposed to be 90 days. So all, everybody, including current NHIF members, are supposed to re-register with the social health authority. So it's 90 days. And how soon should contributions begin? Contributions can be begin immediately. And the good thing is even NHIF contributes or contributions that have been made uh, in, in advance are going to just be prorated based on whatever new rate we agree upon in terms of the regulations and then, so contributions are also continuous in that sense. So you, the plan is to register every person or every household in the country, isn't it? Yes. As per the law? Yes. Um, so how, 
do you determine that you've registered every household in the country so that when you begin the contributions, it is fair that everyone is contributing? Or it's not a requirement? Well, that is the objective, to, re to register everybody within the country. You do remember that the mandatory requirement is one of the things that is the subject of the court case. Because we were looking, at, the spirit was to look for a way of being able to make sure everybody contributes. Because mm -hmm. in social health insurance, if we don't get that universality, then the business model collapses because the financial projections will not be met. Secondly, that would mean that again we cannot promise the benefits that we did. That we did if we don't meet the financial projections. But it's going to be a continuous process and we are hopeful at the end of the day that we're going to get a significant part of Kenyans uh, registering. Of course, those in formal employment, nothing changes. And that has always been the case. Then they'll still continue making their contributions by the 9th. So it is actually those in, non, in so-called self-employed is where we're going to have a challenge. The reason I'm asking that question is because there's a window of 90 days. Yes. And the plan is to register everyone. Mm -hmm. So what makes a uh, an employee in the formal sector not to delay until the 90th day so that when everyone else is being deducted, that's when the deductions begin. Otherwise, if you register early, you will be deducted. In the formal sector, you see it's a statutory requirement. So by the 9th of every month, every employee's contributions must be submitted. So at the end of the day, they'll have to register before the 9th of the next month. But well, there, there's also a requirement for the non-salaried Kenyans, the non-employed. Yes, but in terms of enforcement, that's where the challenge is for the non-salaried Kenyans. So how will you do it? Kenyans. Because now you are the authority. How will you do that it? Is, I told you that is the subject of the, of the court case because Section 26.5 is the one that was going to make it easier for people to be caught into that, to, 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 to be able to, to be made to register. But in the absence of Section 26.5, then we have a bit of a challenge. But that is for the court to determine. Now, you see, Chairman, I want us to conclude, but the CS was here and she said that um, this registration, it is already clear there's a working formula on the means testing instrument is ready that is going to be applied by SHA. Is it ready? The means testing instru instrument is ready to, do, to be deployed. And so that is, but the process of deployment also takes a while. All right, but it is ready to be deployed. So when do you deploy it? You have to deploy it to the point of registration. And that we cannot, you see at the end of the day, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example. The means testing instrument is supposed to be deployed to determine what, what level of contribution you give. Until we are through with the regulations, we don't know what the final outcome is going to be. So you're going to deploy it. At the time you deploy it, if, for example, 2.75% is what is maintained, then we say, some get 100,000, 2.75, your contribution is this. At that point, you're registered and you make your contribution. So that's the role of the means testing instrument. But for the non-employed Kenyans, it is focusing on certain characteristics of their households. Yes. So when will you roll it out? That's what I'm asking. We'll roll it out at the point of registration. You see the good thing, there are very many ways in which you can be able to deploy the means testing instrument. For example, we can use, for example, the CHPs, who are the ones who are going to be visiting households. And they use various household characteristics, and there's a scientific way of being able to determine what someone's income is based on their consumption. All right. Chairman, so many questions. And of course, it's such a process, and we'll be waiting to see how the rollout yes. commences. And wish you all the best Thank as you, you go ahead with this, uh, the implementation of the social health authority that uh, will succeed the National Health Insurance Fund that has been the chairperson of the board, that is Dr. Timothy Oloen, is speaking to us tonight. You're back in a moment.